if you have your Bibles or a copy of God's Word, print or digital form, why don't you take that? We're going to the New Testament this morning. New Testament passage in the book of 1 Timothy. If you make your way through the Gospels and then you get to Acts and Romans, you still got a little ways to go. 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then you're there. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I thought you, you got there pretty fast. Well done. I'm impressed with you all. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting a new series this morning in uh, the month of November called The Search for Happiness. And you know, happiness means something different to different people. Many in our modern society today attempt to, quote, find happiness in maybe material possessions or a new job, if they could just change careers, maybe even a, try to find happiness in a significant other or someone that they have been searching for. In the end, though, all of those things often leave us just as empty as we were before. And so the search continues. And so in our series, this search for happiness, we're going to focus specifically on our walk with Jesus Christ and finding true thankfulness this holiday season. And I think true thankfulness is what brings us lasting joy and contentment. In our text today, uh, it's a commonly text that is taking taken out of context in our culture. When I did a Google search, and you could do this on your computer or device, when I did a Google search for money is the root and left it empty, it auto-filled with the words of all evil. But as we will see today, that is actually a misquote of a very popular Bible verse. There are all sorts of clever cliches and proverbs about money and about riches. Let me give you a few. One of those is this, money talks but all mine ever says is goodbye. (laughs) Mark Twain used to say that the lack of money is the root of all evil. It was Elizabeth Taylor, I believe, who who quipped and said, How can money be the root of all evil if shopping is the cure of all sadness? But here's my favorite cliche, my favorite proverb of money. Money is the root of all evil. For more information, send $10 to me. That's my favorite. Well, in our passage this morning, after installing Timothy as the pastor of the church at Ephesus, Paul sends him two letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy in our Bibles. And these letters are to equip him for the task of pastoring and shepherding and leading this church. And we could summarize Paul's propositions in his letters this way in a very simple statement. True gospel preaching leads to true godly practice. He goes over these key ingredients, if you will, that make for a healthy church. And in chapter 6 here in 1 Timothy, he gives young Timothy some practical ways to deal with the false teachers that were prevalent in his day. These prosperity preachers, if you will, were promising financial gain for those who would name it and claim it by faith. And they were also trying every scheme imaginable to try to get rich on and from the redeemed of Jesus Christ. Look with me, beginning in verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading the Christian Standard Bible this morning. Paul writes, teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. 
but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. Boy, do we see that in our day today. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Verse 6, don't miss this. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now jump over to verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth but rather on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. And then verse 19, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we have so much to learn. We have so much to come to understand of conversations to have in our world today. God, this passage that we have read this morning is so evident of our need for you. God, would you help us to intersect and to engage this culture and this generation with the truth? Thank you for the opportunity to host the Unapologetics Conference and to better learn the skills of how to have a conversation with someone, to be ready to give an answer. But Lord, this morning, as we, as we focus on these words from Paul to Timothy, and these key ingredients of a healthy church and this search for happiness that all of us have journeyed on, Pray, God, that you would reveal yourself in a powerful way. Teach us something new. Help us to have a true focus on your word. Father, we love you. We praise you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in verses 6 through 8 here, Paul gives us three ways to become a content Christian, And I want to look at those three first, and then we're going to look at some of the other verses that we read in more detail in just a moment. Three things that Paul tells us in verses 6, 7, and 8 of how we can be a content Christian. And here's the first one if you're a note taker. We prioritize godliness over gain. Look again at verse 6. But godliness with contentment and Those of you that are good at math, you could say godliness plus contentment equals great gain. And there's a word there that's very powerful, and it's the first word of verse 6, the word but. And it shows the contrast with the common teaching of that day. Godliness leads to contentment, which is great gain. And the word great is the Greek word for megas, and it's the word that we get our words for large or mega or huge. And so instead of focusing on wealth and health, we are to prioritize our growth in godliness, that we would have mega growth in godliness. Godliness does not give you financial gain it itself is gain when combined with contentment there's a partnership there there's a welding together 
of godliness and contentment. And when we seek our satisfaction in the Savior, we will become a content Christian. We prioritize godliness over gain. The second thing he says is that we proclaim what we have is not ours. Everything that you have has been given to you, and you cannot take what you do have with you when you die. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. The word nothing is translated absolutely nothing. There's a great emphasis there that absolutely nothing is taken out of this world. We find this taught to us in other portions of our Bible. Job chapter 1 verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. Solomon The great king, the one who had all the wisdom in the world. He discovered this in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 15. As I came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. The psalmist would write in Psalm 49, 17, For when he dies, he will carry nothing away made me think of years ago when I saw an old bumper sticker that said, He who dies with the most toys still dies. And then the third thing that Paul teaches Timothy here, to be content, you need to understand that you pursue wanting what you already have. Isn't that interesting? Notice verse 8. If we have food and clothing... We will be content with these. We will be content with what we have. Contentment is not having everything you want. Contentment comes when you want what you already have. Proverbs 15, chapter 16 says, Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. It's interesting if you were to read the story of the millionaire J.D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller once answered a question that was posed to him, How much money is enough? Here's what Rockefeller said, just a little bit more. And after he died, someone asked the question to a family member, how much did he leave behind? And the answer was, all of it. All of it. But in contrast with Rockefeller, Listen to the words of Corey Ten Boom. She says, I've held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. You see, contentment is not a function of what you possess but it is a function of what you cherish. The key question for us this morning, as we think about this search for happiness, the key question is, is Christ alone enough for you and me? Is Jesus enough? Or does our search continue for all these other material possessions and new jobs and better pay and better benefits and a significant other? Christians can be content because Christ is with us. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't it interesting that we love to take that last part of Hebrews 13, 15, and we put everything within us on that part. He will never leave us nor forsake us, but we forget the beginning of that verse to keep our lives 
free from the love of money and be content with what we have because he will never leave us or forsake us. Make sure as you study scripture that you study the whole part of it and not just the last part that we hold on to. But then in verse 9, we see this contrast with contentment come into play. Look again. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. Paul lays out here for us in one verse four dangers of chasing after Rockefellers just a little bit more theory in life. Let me outline them for you quickly. He says the first one is desire. The danger of desire. And this word desire, it comes with the connotation to crave, to long for, to be out on the ledge and to stretch yourself out to get something. Putting yourselves in harm's way or in danger because of your desires. Many years ago now, Money Magazine declared that money is now the number one obsession of Americans. And I think that obsession has only grown over the years. Newsweek reports that we have achieved a new plane of consciousness that they call transcendental acquisition. That it's all we think about is acquiring and gaining more stuff, more money. It's easy for our desire for money to become an idol. And one of the problems with idols, church, is they need to be fed because idols are always hungry. And their needs are insatiable. They demand an ongoing sacrifice. They demand the desire that just continues to grow within you. A second danger that Paul presents to Timothy here is deviation. He says that those who get rich or want to be rich fall into temptation. It's an illustration here that he is writing that's found in Genesis chapter 13. If you read that story you find where Lot chose the best land. But in doing so, he set up shop. He set up his tent right next door to Sodom. And he deviated. And if we try to coast, if we try to take a different road, if we deviate from the instructions that God has given us, we will eventually compromise our convictions. And you fall into temptation. And then Paul says a third danger here of the Rockefeller theory is deception. Notice that phrase here that we fall into a trap or maybe your translation says a snare. It's not a drum, but it's a senseless and harmful desire. A snare is like a trick. It's like a sudden, unexpected trap that you're just walking along the way and you don't notice that hole in the ground and you fall into it. And the word senseless refers to something being irrational or foolish and likely harmful, which causes injury or you become hurt. It reminds me of a vivid picture that we find in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 7. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them or take it for yourself, lest you be ensnared, lest you be trapped by it, for it is what? An abomination to the Lord your God. Deception is real and it is out there. And if you desire it more and you deviate from the truth, then you fall into the final thing that Paul says to Timothy, destruction. It leads to destruction. A very dark place, he says, it plunges people into ruin 
and destruction. And this word plunge comes with a connotation of sinking to the bottom of a lake. That you plunge to the depths of darkness. Well, I mentioned to you at the beginning of our time here that verse 10 is likely one of the most misquoted verses in all of Scripture. Look again. It says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Underline is a root. We notice this right away. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is a root of all evil. Money in and of itself cannot be evil. What you choose to do with that makes it a root of evilness. Well, let's skip over. To the other three verses we read, 17, 18, and 19. And in our remaining time here, I want to give you some specific ways to be fruitful. To find contentment with your finances. Paul addresses, in the very first part of 17, those, he says, in the present age. Instruct those who are rich in the present age. You may think that that phrase, the present age, does not include you. But friends, compared to the rest of this world, all of us have more than what others have. You are rich, my friends. No matter the bottom line of your bank account, you are rich Even if you do not consider yourself wealthy, this wisdom that Paul shares with us is spot on for every single one of us today. Notice that he wants Timothy to instruct those, to charge them. It's a very strong language that Paul is using with with Timothy. It's, It's a military command. Instruct charge and what he is saying there is advance these things remind the rich in the present age which includes all of us six very quick things here's the first do not be haughty with what you have to be haughty or as this translation uses arrogant it means to be high-minded To be proud and for pridefulness to begin to set in. Because see, having some wealth can make us feel like we are worthy more and that we are better than those who have less than us. He says, do not become arrogant. Do not be haughty with what you have. When we think we are something, It's good to ponder the question asked in 1 Corinthians 4. What do you have that you did not receive? It's a good question. See, the issue is not about how much money you have, but how much does your money have you? Albert Schweitzer once said, if you have something that you cannot live without, you do not own it. It owns you. And so it's a good question to ask ourselves, do my possessions possess me? Am I haughty and arrogant and prideful with what I have? Or do I understand what I have Or what do you have that you did not receive? Receive from who? The Lord. He's given us everything. Second thing Paul says, charge the church with, do not set your hopes on what you have. 
He tells us here that riches are uncertain, which means they are not safe. They come and go. Proverbs 23 verse 5 tells us, When your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprout wings, flying like an eagle towards heaven. We feel like that sometimes when we go to our online bank and we go, where did all my money go? Money's like seawater. The more you drink it, the thirstier you become. And again, Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes 5, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. All of this is vanity. My good friend Rory down at Lubbock Impact, who does a phenomenal job for that ministry, and a ministry that it started out of this great church. Rory reminds us that we are all one paycheck away from needing their services. We're all one paycheck away from needing what Lubbock Impact offers people in this community. Lubbock's working poor. And we thank God for Lubbock Impact and the financial support that this church gives and the the support volunteer and hours that you provide. Don't set your hopes on what you have. You just might need Lubbock Impact tomorrow. A third thing that Paul says is to set your hopes on God and enjoy what you have. You see, we can do this because of what Paul says, because God richly provides us with all things for what? To enjoy. Christians do not have to be commundrons, because God wants us to find pleasure in the gifts that he has given to us. Why? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And the word richly here means abundantly. Our cups overflow, amen? We've been abundantly blessed. And the key is to recognize that everything we have is a gift from God. Everything, big or small. I mentioned this verse earlier in our prayer time, Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. It gives us this balance between want and need. Remind you again, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Set your hopes on God, the provider, and enjoy the gifts that he has given to you. The fourth thing that Paul tells this pastor is to do good with what you have. He says, instruct them, charge them to do what is good, to be rich in good works. James chapter 2 says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things for the body. What good is that? God has blessed you. God has uniquely positioned you for good works because of the riches that he has given to you. And we are wealthy. We are rich in this present age. A fifth thing is to be generous with what you have. We are to be ready to share. It's one of the unique things we find in the beginning of the first church in the book of Acts. They shared everything. They gave everything freely given what has been freely given to them. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 points to this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Nothing, my friends, nothing cures greed like giving. Because coveting cannot live in the same neighborhood with generosity. And so if you're struggling to be generous, let me give you just three quick ways that you can give your way out of covetedness. One of them, Operation Christmas Child. It's an easy way to give your way out of covetedness. There's a number of empty boxes right out here to your left by the fireplace. We had a family last Sunday that joined in second service. They visited twice. On their second Sunday, they joined this great church and they took five boxes home last week. A second way that you can give your way out of covetedness is coming And that's towards Lubbock Impact's hygiene bags. In just a few weeks, we do this every year this time. And roughly between 200 and 300 hygiene bags are needed because folks down at Lubbock Impact and the money that they have, the reason that they come to Lubbock Impact is because they can't pay for all the things that are necessary like deodorant and shampoo so that they can buy diapers for their children. They can buy baby food for their kids. And so a simple way is to put together a hygiene bag. Products that you and I buy at Walmart all the time take for granted. And then a third way that you can give your way out of covetedness, again coming just a couple of weeks, is fostering hope. And we foster hope for about 30 families that we partner with through Nat Williams Elementary in a ministry called Elevate every year. And we provide those families, some of them with six and seven children in one family, some of them being raised by grandma and grandpa. We provide them a Christmas. And it is sweet to see the joy that comes in knowing that a church cares enough, is generous with what they have. And the sixth and final thing that Paul tells Timothy here is to invest what you have in eternity. We live in a day and age that's all about investments. And investments like your bank account come and go, (laughs) up and down. Look at the first part of verse 19. Store up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for what? The coming age. A foundation for the future. We're to lay up in heaven so a foundation can be laid down for us when we get there. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven for where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. In the book, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer wrote these timely words for us today. Our woes began when God was forced out of his central shrine and things were allowed to enter. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. Friends, have you taken the gifts from God and swapped them for who God is? Applying this passage to our lives is like happiness, as I said at the beginning. It's different for all of us today. Some of you maybe this morning, applying this scripture means to work less. And I understand there's a consequence that comes with that. It means that you make less. But it may also mean that it is a way for you to better lead your family. For you to serve this church Serve in ways that God has uniquely designed you to serve the time that you need to advance God's kingdom. For others of you today, and applying this passage maybe means that 
You need to be more generous with what you have. You truly understand how wealthy and rich you are. Still for others, applying this truth may mean repenting of your lust for wealth and truly find contentment in Christ alone and not in our possessions. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For he he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You and I will never grow in contentment without a consuming passion for Jesus. If our attention is on Christ and His riches that He has bestowed upon us, we ultimately receive the greatest reward possible. Eternity in His presence. So what are you searching for? What is it that you have placed all of your hope for happiness in? If it's not Christ, it's fleeting. Father, we thank you for the power and the truth of your word today. We can find...